In my previous video, I laid out how the world of Dragon Bond by Draco Studios is a multifaceted IP composed of a board game, war game, an RPG keyed to 5e rules, and backed by hundreds of 3D printable models. I thought this approach was really interesting because it allows you to experience the imagined world in different ways and really having every last type of creature 3D printable and holdable in your hands is rare in RPGs other than 5e and your run-of-the-mill fantasy. In this video, I'm going to cover more of the RPG aspect of Dragon Bond, specifically Great Worms of Draka, a 7 adventure supplement for 5e set in the world of Dragon Bond and intended for players level 17 through 20. Some in the D&D 5e community refer to adventures by tiers where those adventures that are intended for characters level 17 through 20 are considered tier 4. The idea in this book is that you and your party start off as incredible heroes, most likely from another place, but end up on the red moon of Draka. Draka is a moon of the world of Rava, where all dragons were banished eons ago. On this moon, which has an atmosphere and different biomes like jungles and deserts, think of it as a small planet is where hundreds of dragons roost at the top of a hierarchy that goes Azurma, brood dragons, dragonkin, other creatures, then races from Valerna, the main continent of the mother planet from where people are occasionally kidnapped every 27 years. In each of the seven adventures, the idea is that you work your way to the top of one of these seven broods and fight its dragon master, or Azurma. The path to that Azurma differs wildly depending on the adventure, and the fight with the apex dragon itself is varied from one to the next, even though they all follow a shared infrastructure. Okay, just to make sure that all this makes sense, let me recap the lore of Dragon Bond a little bit. I won't retell the whole story, but here are some salient points. On the massive continent of Valerna, dragons once defied their makers, the Protagons. In an epic struggle, they ended up stripped of prime magic called Vala and banished to a moon called Draka, which orbits the planet. But one of these dragons was able to create a sort of teleportation gate that allowed the dragons to return to Valerna every 27 years. Their sole purpose when returning to the home planet is to ravage all sources of Vala, and they have a few days to do so before the portal closes for another 27 years. For every creature they consume containing Vala, they absorb that energy and potentially increase their status when they return to Draka. But the dragons do more than just consume. They kidnap people for a huge variety of purposes to use as agents, spies, artisans, test subjects, and workers. So right there, you have a sort of built-in modularity with this set of adventures, since they all take place on a dragon-infested world removed from even its own mother planet. You can transport characters to this world from virtually any other. The book even openly suggests this. In other words, you don't have to be running adventures in Valerna to suddenly be whisked away to Draka to face down one of seven gargantuan dragons. Anyway, the world of Draka is a hellish, inhospitable place, and there are several special rules on survivability. The first is that water is extremely scarce, and it takes a DC 25 survival check to find water. Any spell that creates water will only yield half the spell's capacity and that water will always be murky and bitter. The spells Revivify, Raise Dead, Resurrection, and similar spells only work on bodies that did not have their Vala completely stripped from them at the moment of their death. Vala in the setting can be taken from a creature either by being consumed by a dragon or struck with a weapon containing a special Vala absorbing stone called a Vara Crystal. Teleportation does not work well on Draka, but it's up to the DM on how that actually plays out at the table. And aside from the many various special powers and abilities of the dragons, they all have advantage on saving throws against spells and spell-like abilities and are immune to the maze spell. Since the main thrust of this adventure supplement is epic level 20 battles with massive boss dragons, the authors put some real work into expanding baseline 5e combat to include more options and more strategy. The first of these is that hit points, actions per round, and certain other features of the dragon and its surroundings will scale up depending on how many there are in the party. Secondly, each battle with an Azurma has three phases. A change in phases is triggered by certain thresholds being met, like a certain amount of damage being rendered 
to the dragon or certain things happening to the specialized environment around it. With each new phase, the dragon's combat behavior changes, and often the environmental threats also change or increase. Dragons each have a selection of actions that they can take during their turn, some more powerful than others. The limiting factor is their action pool. They get a certain number of actions based on the number of PCs in the fight as well as the phase of the battle they're in. And from there, the DM can spend those action points strategically to create the most challenging turn. Any unspent points are lost and don't roll over to the next turn. Exploits are various and sundry materials, situations, or actions available to the PC that can change or occasionally weaken the boss dragon. This is actually one of the big reasons I don't plan on showing you the pages of the book that describe the dragon battles because these exploits are a critical part of the experience. In the three or four sessions leading up to the big fight, players need to work to figure out these exploits and the DM needs to find a way to provide them. Hit points are broken down into body parts on the dragon, upper and lower torso, left and right claws, left and right legs, wings, tail, and head. Each part has its own specs, and when a part's HP is brought down to zero, that part is considered broken and useless for the rest of combat. There's also a whole mini mechanic that addresses mounting the dragon using either athletics, acrobatics, animal handling, or survival against a body part's shake DC. Naturally, a player has to start at the legs or tail, but they could conceivably climb their way to the head of the beast and land some melee attacks. Each of these seven adventures ends with an epic boss battle, but the structure they all share contains a four session adventure leading to that final fight. At the risk of spoiling this first adventure, I wanna show you the level of depth and detail that the adventures are presented with. And for the remaining six, I will just describe the opening premise. The Voice of Descent starts you in the Golden City on Draca, the sole gleaming bastion of civilization created and ruled by the largest and most enlightened of the Azurmas, Arius Fulgen. The city is filled with not just dragon kin, but Valernians like yourself who live as third-class citizens in a perpetual state of inequality. Despite this ingrained mistreatment, dragonkin in the city still want the Valernians exiled completely and will do anything to make that happen, even overthrow the big boss, Arius. The layout and description of the adventures across four acts is repeated with all the adventures and is very thorough. I really appreciated in this first adventure how much politics and social encounters played a part since that's not necessarily 5e's strong suit. One other notable feature throughout the book is that it's filled with remarkable illustrations. The ones of NPCs and monsters are particularly evocative and helpful for a DM trying to bring this world to life. As with all of the adventures in this book, the idea is that your character starts at level 17 and works their way up to level 20 before facing off with the final dragon, which means there are massive amounts of XP being rewarded and any items worth keeping are going to be incredibly powerful. Naturally, there are a lot of dragon kin as well, so it would probably grease the wheels a bit to ensure that your PCs have a serviceable level of draconic under their belts. I found all of the encounter maps in the book to also be pretty top notch as well. All of the stat blocks for all of these NPCs and enemies are actually found at the end of the book, mostly without illustrations, so there is a bit of flipping back and forth on your first read through. I think they put the stat blocks at the end so that they wouldn't get repeated in cases where an enemy type shows up in more than one adventure. But as you can see, these adventures are pretty packed with written detail and artwork, almost to the point that when you finally play through one, I'd imagine that you'd almost be dragoned out for a while. I'll reveal the stat block and exploits and phases for Arius, that way you can get some idea of the challenge. One thing I didn't mention before is that all dragons have a special damage reduction or DR feature that allows them to reduce all incoming damage by a certain amount, Arius's being seven. There are ways around the DR with magic items and other things. The Primordial Shard is the second adventure and it pits you against Bastharox, the oldest and strongest of the Azurmas. There is a rumor that an artifact in his territory could illuminate the mystery surrounding the portal between Draca and Valerna. You work on behalf of Arius Fulgen to find this artifact, or if you've killed Arius for any reason, 
You could just be trying to find the artifact for yourself. Either way, your journey takes you through deserts, caves, the threat of betrayal, and finally, a wicked, pretty unforgettable battle with Bastarox. Secrets of the Forge's core has you up against Derilia, a master smith dragon who commands an army of smiths inside of a volcano and forges incredibly powerful weapons and relics. One of the things she makes is weapons containing Vara crystals, which steal prime magic from its victim. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to go into that volcano and destroy the Vara motherlode that Derilia is using to make these weapons. This entire adventure is a hot, sweaty trek through underground forges and hardy, ornery creatures. The final fight with Derilia is understandably pretty tough, but even if you defeat her, it's not entirely over. The Hearts of Permutation gets pretty surreal. You wake up with amnesia in a strange chamber. If you survive the trials, you're rewarded with a fight for your life against Kuxkoatl, an infinitely curious dragon who has no moral boundaries when it comes to experimentation. If the tests and trials players face don't kill them, the fight with Kuxkoatl is complex enough that it might do the job. To Be In All Shadows takes place at the edge of the Catacomb Reaches, the home of the undead brood of dragons led by Nixus. Players deal with scattered and isolated tribes of non-dragons trying to eke out an existence in these wastelands, but there is a disease of undeath that lingers everywhere, and a quest for a relic that draws you further into Nyx territory, and ultimately to a pretty disturbing climax before the big fight with Nixus, the Veilbreaker herself. The Scent of Creeping Death is described as a gauntlet, plain and simple. It's a brutal race across desert dunes and rocky hills to evade dragonkin and deliver your fellow captives to safety. Problems arise not just from the pursuers and the local environment, but also from within. And of course, waiting at the end is an encounter with Raraxa, the apex desert huntress. The final adventure is the Crystal Haunts, where players enter the lair of Syvax, the Azurma of the brood Magnifex, which treasures art and beauty above all else. They find maps and relics pointing to the greatest imaginable treasure, but it leads them to Paratus, a place as deadly as any other wild region of Draka, but far stranger and full of beautiful traps and distractions. The fight with Syvax mirrors the one with Kuxkoatl in that it contains a number of challenging environmental factors. The Monsters and NPCs appendix contains a whopping 63 creatures, but again, many of the illustrations of them will be found on previous pages where they are first mentioned in an adventure. The Artifacts and Items appendix contains 23 items, most of which are going to be relatively valuable or powerful since these are tier four adventures. All right, here are my thoughts on Great Worms of Draka. Fighting is the point. Since it's 5e, fighting and trying to kill the boss dragons is inevitable. And not just the dragons, a lot of the exotic and sometimes beautiful draconic creatures on Draka are trying to kill you and you're there to return the favor. There are exceptions throughout the adventures, such as social encounters and plenty of puzzles, traps, and mysteries, but make no mistake, these adventures embrace what 5e is all about at higher levels, epic, violent confrontations with epic dynamic battles. As long as everyone is cool with the nature of the game, you're in for some potentially pretty fascinating dragon fights. With all the new mechanics such as hit points and actions that scale depending on the size of your party, body parts that you have to target and whittle down, phases to each fight, as well as specific exploits and specific environmental features for each dragon, these battles build on 5e's combat rules in a way that make the experience more cerebral and strategic. I have to admit, the new rules don't and can't really address 5e's glaring problem of turn economy, especially at level 20, where every character has a dizzying array of options per turn, but if you've gotten a character to level 20 the honest way, and you have a DM who knows their stuff, turn economy and pacing shouldn't be an issue. In other words, if the dragon battle is being played and run by experienced veterans of the 5e rule set, there's nothing stopping it from being a complete blast well-conceived adventures. Each of the adventures themselves which lead up to the epic boss battles are really different from one another and filled with colorful NPCs and enemies. The adventures all run for about three sessions each, and each session is structured to offer 
a different act to an epic tale. They're bigger than one-shots, but smaller and tighter than a plotting campaign. It's an interesting sweet spot, modular. Most of the adventures include in their description ways for the DM to sideload it into a pre-existing campaign in virtually any fantasy 5e setting. The Red Moon of Draca itself, in a sense, can almost be treated as a pocket dimension, a discrete one-off universe that adventurers visit, spend some time in, do their thing, and then leave. But the one nice thing that Draca has over being just a pocket dimension floating in the ether to be used for dragon fights is that it's actually connected to an increasingly realized greater universe, miniatures. Between the series that covers the Azurmas themselves and the hundreds of monster minis available to print at home or order, you can have most if not all of the enemies you face in these seven adventures in physical form at your table. It goes without saying that you don't need miniatures that look exactly like what the book shows you, but it's an option and it's a really nice one to have. Anyway, that's all for now. As I mentioned, this is the second of three videos that I'm making on Dragon Bond. In my next and final video, I'll be doing a preview of Endless Sagas, the upcoming three book project that lays out the core Dragon Bond RPG in all its glory. Let me know your thoughts below. Thanks for watching. See ya.